I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking. To tell a good story of the or joke kind is to tell it well was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that the seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishment as jokers. They all took after the king too, in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as in inevitable jokers. Rather people grow fat by joking, or rather there is something in the fat itself it produces to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine. But certain it is that being joker is a rara avis in terrace. About the refinement, or he has called them the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. He had especially admiration of Bereth in the jest, and would often put up with length for the sake of it. Over necessities wearied him. He would have preferred Rebellius Gargantua to the Zydegus of Valagius, and upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone of the fashion at court. Several of the greatest potential power still retained their fools, who were morally with cap and bells and would have expected to be always ready for the sharp witticism and the moment notice, in considering of the grumble that fell before the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool. The fact is, he required something in the way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however, he valued of the trembled of the eye of the king, but the fact that he was being also a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarves are common at court, in those days as fools, as many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days without both the jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But as I have already observed, the jesters in, nine, in 99 cases of 100 are fat, round, and unwieldy. So this was a no small source of self-gratitude of our king, that is, Hop Frog. He was as to trip with treasure in one person. I believe the name Hop Frog was not then given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, but it was confirmed preferred upon him by general consent of the several ministers on the account of his inability to walk like other men. In fact, Hopwalk could only get along by the sort of interjectional get, something between a leap and a wriggle movement, kind of movement, an affordable and amenable amusement. And of course, consolation to the king for, notwithstanding a particulars of his stomach and constitutional swelling of his head, the king, by the whole court, was according to the capital figure. But although Hopfrog, due to the distortion of his legs, could only move with great pain and difficult along the road and floor, the prodigious muscular power which was natured seemed to have bestowed upon his arms by the compensation of his dis deficiency of the lower limbs, enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterities where the trees and ropes were in the question or anything else to climb as such an exercise has certainly much more resembled of a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. I am not able to say with precision from what country how frog originally came. It is from a barbarous region, however, that no person have heard of the vast distance from the country of our king. How frog and a young girl, very less dwarfish than himself, have been forcibly carried off from their respective homes in adjoining Providence and sent to present of the king by one of his very victorious generals. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered for the close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends. Hop Frog, who although had made a great deal of sport, was not was not by popularity had been not had been the power of rendering Trapetus many services. But she, on account of her grace and distinguished beauty, was ununiversally admired and petted. So she possessed much influence and never failed to use it whenever she could for the benefit of Hop Frog. On some general state of occasions, I forgot what, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever the masquerade or anything of the kind occurred to our court, then the talented, both of Hop Frog and Tepeta, were sure to be called on into play. For Hop Frog is especially for the inevitable of the way of getting of pegonance, such as novel characters and arranging costumes for mask balls, and nothing could be done. It seems 
without his assistance. The night appointed for the frate had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Tepeta's eye, with a very kind adv device which could possibly be elegant to the masquerade. The whole court was in the fever of expectations. As the costumes and characters, it might as well be supposed to everybody had come to decision at such a point, many had been made up their minds a week or even a month in advance. And in fact, there was no particle of indec indecisions anyway, except for the case of the king and his seven ministers. Why they hesitated, I never could tell, unless they did it a way of a joke. More probably, they found it difficult, in account of being so fat, to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and the last resort, they sent for Terpeta and Hopfrog. When the two friends obeyed the summon of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven members of the cabinet council. But the monarch appeared to be very ill-humored. He knew that Hopfrog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes, and took pleasure in forcing Hopfrog to drink and to be merry. Come, Hopfrog, said the jester, the jester of his friends enter the room. Swallow the bumper to the health of our absent friends, and then let us have a benefit of your invent inventations. He want he wanted characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way. We are weary of the everlasting sameness. Come, drink. The wine will brighten your wits. Hoffrog endeavored, as usual, to get up the jest as a reply of the advance of the king, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command and the command to drink to his absent friends forced a tear in his eyes. Many large bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it humbly from the hand of the tyrant. <laughs> Roared the latter as the dwarf reluctantly drained the backer. See what a glass of good wine can do! Why your eyes are shining already, poor fellow! His large eyes gleamed rather than shone for the effect of the wine on his acceptable brain was no more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked around upon the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. And now to business, said the prime minister, a very fat man. Yeah, yes, said the king. Come, lend us your assistance characters, my fine fellow. We stand in need of characters, all of us. <laughs> and as was serious meant for a joke, his laugh was chores by the seven. Hoffrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat scavenly. Come, come, said the king impatiently. Have you have nothing to suggest? I endeavoring to think of something novel replied the dwarf, abstractedly, for he was well bewildered by the wine. Endeavoring? cried the tyrant fiercely. What do you mean by that? Ah, I perceive you are sulking. Want more wine? Here, drink this. And he poured it on the goblet, filled with the offered into the couple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, shouted the monster or by the fiends. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courier smirked. Trepetta, pale as a corpse, advanced on the monarch's seat and falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moment in evident a wonder of the of her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss of what to do or say, how most to be commonly to express his indigestions. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the content of the brim goblet in her face. The poor girl got up the best she could, and not daring even a sigh, resuming her position in the front of the table. There was a dead silence in the room. Half of a minute went by, during which the falling of a leaf or a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh, partitous, granted sound, which seemed to come from once from every corner of the room. W what are you making that noise for? demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered, in great measure, from his intoxication, 
and looked fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely interjecting. I? How could it have been me? The sound appeared to be coming from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was a parrot at the window, wearing the bill upon his cage wires. True, replied the monarch, as if relieved of the suggestion. But, in honor of the night, I could have sworn that this was gritting from the vagabond's teeth. Hereupon, the dwarf laughed and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and have drained another hot bumper of with no very perceptible ill effect. Hot Frog entered at once, and with spirit, into the plans of the masquerade. I cannot tell what was the occasion of the idea, observed he very tranquilly, and as if he had never tasted wine in his life. But just after just after your majesty it struck the girl and throw the wine in her face. Just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making this odd noise outside the window, there came into a mind of a capital diversion, one of my country's forelocks, often enters among us at the masquerade, but here it will be all new together. Unfortunately, I have acquired company of eight persons and... Here we are, cried the king, laughing at this acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, and I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight-chained orangutangus, and it's really an excellent sport of well-enacted. We will act it, remarked the king, drawing himself and lowering his eyelids. The beauty of the game continued Hoffrog, lies in the fright of occasion among the women. Capital, roared the, roared the chore of the monarch and his ministry. I will equip you with the Rangatangus, proceeded the dwarf. Leave it all to me. I resemble the shell be so striking that the company of the masquerade will take you for real beasts. And of course, they will be much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite! exclaimed the king. Hot frog, I will make a man of you. The chain that are supposed to be increasing of the confusion by their jinglings. You are supposed to have escaped in Massey from your keepers. Your majesty cannot convince the effect produced at the masquerade, but eight chain orangutangs, imagine to be real ones for the most of the company and rushed to the usurpy's cries among the crowd and delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrary is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the councils aroused hurriedly to put an execution to the scheme of Hopfrog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutangus was, was very simple, but effective enough for the purpose. The animal in question had, at the approach of the story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world, and the emanations of the by the dwarf were, were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous. Their truthfulness to the nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitted stockinet shirts and drawers. They were then structured with tar. At this stage of the process, some one of the party suggested feathers, but the suggestion was once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the eight by a coloring demonstrations that the hair of such a brute as the orangutangus was much more effectively represented by flu. A thin coated for the letter was according plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now produ produced. First it was accompanied for the waist of the king, and tied, then about another of the party, and also tied, then about all successively, at the same manner. When this chain arrangement was complete, and the party stood as far apart as each other as possible, they formed a circle, and to make all things appear naturally, Hop Frog passed the residue of this chain in two demeters, at the right angle across the circle, after the fashion adopted at the presented day by the whole capture chimpanzees and other large apes in Barneo.
The grand saloon on which the masquerade was to take place was a cilia room, all very lofty and received the light of the sun only through the single window on top. At night, it was illuminated principally by the large chandelier, depending by the chain of the center of the skylight and lowered and or elevated by means of counterbalance as usual. But this ladder passed outside of the couple was over was over the roof. The original of the room had been left for Trepetta's superintendence. But in some particular, it seems that she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf. At his suggestions, it was that when one of the occasions the chandelier was removed, its waxens dripping dripping would have been seriously determined of the rich dresses of the guests who on account of the crowded state of the saloon could not only expect to keep from out of the centaur this is to say from under the chandelier An additional stone was sent to the various parts of the hall out of the war and the flambeau emitting sweet odor was placed to be right hand of each of the chandeliers then stood against the wall for 50 or 60 altogether the eight orangutangas taking hot frogs advice waited patiently until midnight before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock erased strike striking it, however, they then they rushed, or rather rolled in altogether, for the impediment of the chains caused most of them to partly fall, and all stumbling of their entrance. An excitement among the masquerades was prodigious, and filled the heart of the king with glee, as he had been anticipated where there were not a few of the guests who were supposed to be ferociously looking creatures to be best to be beasts of some kind of in reality. If not precisely orangutangus, many of the women swooned with affright, and had nothing to take the king of precaution or precautions to excel all weapons from the saloon. His party might soon have expected their frolic of their blood, and it was a general rush was made for the door. But the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon his, his entrance, and at the dwarf's suggestions, the key had been deposited with him. While the talent was at the height of its height, and each masquerade intended only to have its own safety, for, in fact, there was much real danger from the, from the pressure of the excited crowd, the chain was which the chandelier ordinarily hung, had which had been drawn up to, the, to its removal, might have been seen and very gradually to descend until the it hooked extremely came within three feet of the floor. Soon after this, the king and his seven friends have reeled upon the hall of all directions, found themselves at length the center of the course, in immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf, who had followed noiselessly at their heels, incited them to keep up the commotion, told them to hold at their own chain at the interactions of the two portions in which crossed the Across the circle demonstrably and at the right angles. Here, with a rapidly thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend, and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain had drawn to the far upwards as to take the hook out of reach, and an inevitable consequence to drag the orangutangus together in the, in the close connections and face to face. The masqueraders, by this time, had recovered for in their some measures and for their alarm, and then beginning to regard the whole matter as a well contracted pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter at the, predic at the predicament of the apes. Leave them to me! Now screamed the hot frog, his thrilled voice making himself easily heard through all the din. Leave them to me! I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are. Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall, where seizing a flambeau from one of the chandeliers, he returned as he went in the center of the room, leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thus clambered to the few feet of the chain, holding down the torch to examine the group, and all rang at Tengus, and still screaming, I shall soon find out who they are! And now, while the whole assembly, in fate secluded, were convulsed with laughter, the gesture suddenly uttered a shrill whistling. Then the chain flew violently up from the thirty feet, dragging with a dismay and struggling orangutangus, and leaving them suspended in midair between the skylight and the floor. Hot Frog, clinging to the chain as it rose, still maintains his relative position in the respect of the eight maskers, 
and still, as if nothing were the, were the matter, continued to thrust his torch down to them, as though endeavoring to discover who they, who they were. So thoroughly astonishing was the, was the whole company of the Ascendant with the dead silent, and the minute of duration ensued. It was broken by such a low, harsh, grating sound as had from attracted from the attention of the king and his counselors for the former threw off the wine of the face of Trapetta. But on the present occasion, there could be no question that the wench of the sound ensured. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf, who grounded them and gnashed them as the foam as he foamed to the mouth and glared with an expression of menacing rage into the upturned coincidence of the king and his seven companions. Aha! said the length of the frustrated dwarf. Aha! I begin to see who they people are now. Here, pretending to sanitize of the king, more closely he held the flambeau of the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into sheets of vivid flame. In less than half a minute, the whole eight orangutangus was blazing furiously. Amid of the shrieking of the multitude who gazed upon them from below, horror-stricken and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length the flame, suddenly increasing the valus, forced the jester to climb higher and up the chain to be out of their reach. And as he made this movement, the crowd again sank for a brief instant into silence. The dwarf seized his opportunity and once more spoke. I now see distinctly, he said, what manner of people these maskers are. They are the great king and his seven privy counselors. A king who does not scalp or the strike a defenseless girl, and his seven counselors who abate him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply Hot Frog the Jester, and this is my last jest. Owing to the high constability of the both of the flax of the tar in which it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end of the brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in the chains, a fitted, black and hideous, and indescribably mass. The cripple hurled his his torch at them, climbing listlessly to the ceiling and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trepetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been an accomplice of her friend the fierce revenge, and that together they effected their escape in their own country, for neither were seen again.